slightly different. Well, actually, not. It's pretty warm here. Good. I just wanted to say hi. And, uh, thank you for coming. Thanks for doing all this. I'll be right behind you if you have the yellow screen. It's hard to say, Abby, right behind you. It's been longer than that? No, that's fine. I'm like a little bit of a little bit Did Greg yeah. said he, someone introduce? I, I can just take it over from here. Um, it'd be up to David if he wanted to introduce you as the advisor. Yeah. Was that the first closure you've ever had at Utrecht? Yeah, it was the first closure I've ever had. Well, um, scary world these days, isn't it, huh? Yeah, that's, you know, here in the States, what they do is they just kill themselves, you know, and, uh, which is really unsatisfying in many ways. Uh, many people, uh, at least there's some sort of a trial that will happen, and maybe there's some closure that's slightly different. So, it's getting noisy here. Yeah. Not real closure, huh? Yeah. Okay, I think we're almost ready to start here, so. Very cool. That one. That one? Excellent. Um, Tom asked earlier what the, what the normal setting of accumulation rate is in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of that? That's on your time scale. Yeah. If you look at 210, we're looking at 10 centimeters over the last 100 years to, 100, to, to up to 50 you know, off in the Mississippi. In, you know, Mississippi Canyon area, yeah. yeah. You know the right answer. That's yeah, right answer. I mean, from our data. But, from but if you do, if you do, long, if you do a, a C14, C14, it's more like 270,000. Right, something. right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to the thesis defense or <coughs> dissertation defense of Rebecca Larson. Uh, Rebecca is, a, is really quite a remarkable <laughs> student. She's been here for a few years. <laughs> uh, came from Eckert with a uh, bachelor's degree in oceanography with disciplines in geology. Uh, got a master's here in 2011 and then was really working uh, full time at Eckert College. And she, uh, uh, to list the things that she has done and what she does at Eckert is pretty remarkable. Uh, I won't go into it, but needless to say, she has been uh, a vital, vital, vital person for us in the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, studies uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Rebecca has uh, been not only a participant, but she's actually been chief scientist for a number of cruises. Uh, I counted them up, 22 cruises, to be precise. Not as chief scientist. Huh? But not, not as a, chief scientist, yeah. but uh, Rebecca has a lot of skills, and to put her in the position of being a chief scientist was not even a debate. So uh, she's really quite remarkable and organized and capable in every domain. Uh, to say that she's productive and a participant with a lot of people's research uh, is understated. Uh, certainly at this stage in her career, 22 publications, uh, uh, five book chapters, 110 abstracts, and we can go on and on and on. And Becca has really, like I said, been a vital component uh, with Greg Brooks uh, and Patrick in the dating of the sediments 
uh, in the northern Gulf of Mexico, which is what we'll hear about today. And that has really been the sort of the cornerstone for uh, the work that Sea Image has done in the sediments and enabled us to really put our foot forward about uh, the events that happened in the Deepwater Horizon, uh, how uh, the sediments played such a significant role as an unexpected consequence of oil deposition. Uh, so we're going to hear uh, about that today, but first let me introduce the, the committee. Uh, we have uh, Steve Morawski hiding there in the corner, uh, Greg Brooks from Eckerd College, Brad Rosenheim uh, in the Geological Sciences here, and on the screen over here uh, is Gert Jan Reichert from uh, the University of Utrecht, uh, which as you guys might know had a, quite an experience the day before yesterday. So we're actually very lucky to have it here. <coughs> Apparently the university was closed yesterday. So um, we're very lucky to have him here. And again, uh, in addition, we have another, we're really lucky to have uh, Tom Cronin here as, I guess, the chairman of the committee. Uh, Tom has been uh, active with a lot of us in this uh, area. He's from the USGS, uh, I guess, in Reston, right? Yep. Uh, you're not retired, though, right? No. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the way to ask us or not retired. Uh, no. Good. It's good to have you here. Uh, and we're very lucky to have him here uh, as, uh, I guess, you call him the moderator or the chair of the committee. So uh, I'm not going to even read your uh, title. I'll let you do that, Becca, but it's a pleasure to have you here. So I'll say a word. Thank you, uh, Dave. Yes, I know Dave and uh, others in this room, and unfortunately a couple of USDS uh, people we lost recently, <laughs> Terry Edgar and, and Chuck Holmes, but we had uh, a big Tampa Bay project that Kenny Yates and others ran, and I uh, first got to work with Becca and Greg on the sediment cores and with Terry Edgar. And so I know their work uh, and how excellent it is, and I'm really happy to see geology applied to an, an environmental problem that typically uh, might not appreciate all that uh, people who understand sediments can do. So all I'm going to do is uh, let Becca speak for 45 minutes, open to the general public for questions, have a five minute break. Uh, the committee, everybody is welcome to stay uh, according to the rules, unless I decide you're unruly. But <laughs> after, after the break, uh, the committee asks about, about 15, 20 minutes of questions each uh, to Becca, and she'll answer those. And uh, other than that, hi, Herd Jan. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. I know Herd Jan from uh, Italy. So uh, other than that, are there any questions before we start? OK. 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank everybody for coming today. Um, I'd like to thank my committee uh, for, and Tom Cronin for coming down from uh, Virginia to be the chair. So this afternoon I'm going to talk about work uh, involving high resolution investigations of event sedimentation and in particular the response evolution uh, and evolution of the deep water horizon blowout in the sedimentary system. Um, as Tom mentioned, there are some research scientists that have been formative in my career as well as others. I'd like to acknowledge uh, that have passed away in the recent years. Uh, Terry Egger recently, Ben Flower, who was one of the critical components of the beginning of our investigations and a strong proponent for the two millimeter sampling we'll be talking about today. And uh, Chuck Holmes, who was a committee member who passed away this fall. So the, uh, a little bit of an outline of the things we're gonna talk about today and a little bit of a sequence. So I'll give you uh, my primary two objectives and a little bit of background on event stratigraphy the deep water, blows, blow out, uh, deep water horizon blowout event, um, some methodology. Then we're going to get into some of the methods that we had to refine to use in this uh, high resolution setting and then talk about some of the, our findings for the deep water horizon event um, and following up with some conclusions. Uh, two broad um, primary objectives that are going to kind of go hand in hand. One could not have been done without the other. The first objective uh, is to refine and advance the methods and approaches for high resolution investigations of events in the sedimentary system and sedimentary records. And the second one is to investigate the potential sedimentological impacts of the deep water horizon blowout event on the deep sea benthos. And we'll talk about why doing these in tandem was a critical component for each of their success. 
So a little background on events in the sedimentary record. Um, there can be natural events. Um, there can also be anthropogenic events like the Deepwater Horizon blowout. They're often of short duration of days, months, um, and can have negative impacts to the ecosystem, whether they're short-term or potentially long-term impacts. In the sedimentary records, we define them as deviations from natural or normal sedimentation patterns. Um, they're usually some sort of sedimentary signature of that event, which can be defined as changes in rates, sedimentation or accumulation. In the sedimentology, uh, there can be chemical indicators or biological indicators of this deviation. One of the critical components is age control on your sediment records and geochronology to know the timing of the deposition of that event and potentially also to provide those sedimentation rates which may have changed. And so one thing we're going to talk about today is choosing the appropriate time scale, short term versus long term, um, to be able to look at these events in the sediment record as well as what are the normal patterns that you're defining this deviation from. So our tool of choice are sediment cores as they're recorders or can be very good recorders of, change, of sediment sources, uh, the depositional mechanism, how did sediment get to the seafloor, and that environment. They can tell you about different environmental parameters and how these, uh, these variables may change over time naturally or during an event as deviations from the natural. Um, so one question is when you do do this is what is the natural and how do you define the magnitude of the sedimentation event is in reference to that natural sedimentation patterns so how good are those recorders and these are things that we always assess when we do sediment projects we often take many cores and select the best for events um, you select cores that are appropriate for your objectives um, would, would they be in proximity to the event? Would they potentially have deposits associated with that event and are in the in-depth centers where sediments are accumulating? And then we assess those cores and select the best based upon their visual inspection, data profiles that show that there's stratigraphic integrity, that there's not strong influence of uh, post-depositional alterations, which may be remobilization, erosion, suspension. Um, if there's burial, what's the preservation potential? And we'll talk about some of these influences a little bit later as well in the context of our study. So the um, Deepwater Horizon event, um, we had the opportunity to go out there in the very beginning, did a real-time investigation of the Deepwater Horizon event um, beginning in 2010 through to the present and look at the potential sedimentary ecosystem impacts of the event and try and assess the short-term months to years impacts to compare to the longer-term potential impacts. And we're using our tool of choice sediment cores to look for any deviations that may be associated with this event. So the Deepwater Horizon uh, blowout event occurred in the northern Gulf of Mexico on April 20th and extended to July 15th of 2010, um, where the mobile uh, drilling unit exploded, caught fire, and sank. Broke a riser pipe at depth um, of 1,500 meters water depth and released oil and natural gas into the system and had a duration of 87 days of oil release before they could cease it. In the Gulf of Mexico is a physiographic map. So we have our Deepwater Horizon site up here as an orange star with uh, proximity to the Mississippi River as well as the DeSoto Canyon area and the Florida Shelf. And this region is uh, complex sedimentologically. This is a map showing um, mm. surface sediment distribution for the Gulf of Mexico with siliciclastics from the Mississippi River on this edge. But you go very close by, you get into a carbonate regime. So we're looking at two different sedimentary regimes where this oil spill may have implications. So how did the hydrocarbons get into the system and what are some of the mechanisms that may have uh, gotten these, uh, the oiled sediments to the seafloor? So we're going to walk through this figure. So we have a broken riser pipe here at depth, which is releasing oil and gas. They also apply dispersants at depth. It rises. There were subsurface surface plumes that were um, observed, which may impinge on the seafloor and interact with oil to the seafloor. This plume also rose all the way to the surface, where there are multiple things going on in surface waters from remediation as well as biological processes that led to what was called marine oil snow and uh, the interaction of the biology to get secrete an exopolymeric sus substance that was sticky, oil, sediment, and these um, phytoplankton bonded together, lost buoyancy, and sank to the seafloor rather rapidly to create 
MOSFA, marine oil, snow, sedimentation, and flocculent accumulation. So we're going to focus here at the seafloor where um, the oil and its integration into the sedimentary system. And so once again, the coring is our tool of choice. For this, we use multi-cores um, for multiple reasons. One is which uh, you can collect eight cores simultaneously, so you can have a multidisciplinary project with multiple types of investigation going on at the same deployments. And they collect cores up to 60 centimeters in length. Um, this gets us back well over the last 100 years, so we can look at down core as pre-event sedimentation patterns to try and discern what was the normal sedimentation patterns or baselines. They're also really good, can be very good at preserving the sediment water interface. As we can see over here, this is a, a retrieval on deck. And this is really important for, since we are looking at very recent sedimentation and we're doing high resolution sampling, um, we need to be able to look at that service intact. So we did a rapid collection of cores in the fall of 2010, which allowed us to look at the immediate response prior to the deposition alteration of uh, sediments and be able to use time sensitive indicators. And we'll talk about using Thorium 234XS as a geochronometer and other indicators by collaborators that may be subject to alteration. It also gave us the highest potential to detect the event at its strongest magnitude in the uh, benthic response. Following that rapid collection 2010, um, we did a time series up until 2017 where we went out and took cores. Um, these are core photographs on the right of our four time series sites and took cores on an annual basis to continue to, to monitor how and assess how the sedimentary system is evolving over time on a very high temporal resolution. So our sites in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico, these black dots are all core sites where we collected cores um, to, to do a full assessment of this project. And uh, our four time series sites are located here. The orange star is the Deepwater Horizon. This gray shading is uh, one of the surface extent for the surface oil slick, so looking at where that moss for process may have been occurring. So we have two sites, um, DSH-08 and DSH-10, that are on the siliciclastic side of the DeSoto Canyon, and two sites that are on uh, PCB-06 and M04 on the carbonate side of the canyon, so we can try and look at how those two sediment regimes may be responding. So we took core, uh, we have one core that we split longitudinally, um, photographed, described, and assessed for stratigraphic integrity. This is our core photograph over here with uh, depth in centimeters. Um, this surficial unit uh, is usually associated with uh, redox geochemistry, which is one of the indicators used by collaborators. And then some of the meat today we're going to talk about are from our, our cores that we extruded. Uh, we did very high resolution sampling to maintain high temporal resolution. This led to very small sample masses per uh, interval that we extruded. So we extruded it using a calibrated threaded rod that was uh, two millimeter sampling and scraped it off the surface into our containers for our analyses to perform bulk density to get the total mass per volume, as well as this is the material we uh, used for our short-lived radioisotope analyses and sediment texture and composition. Uh, sediment texture and composition, we were looking at those using texture to look at potentially energy and transport, but also in the deep environment might be from sediment sources from primary productivity of forams and diatoms um, using standard techniques. And composition, um, primarily looking at sediment sources that trigger this Mississippi River versus the carbonate sources of sediment and how maybe those had shifted or changed um, due to the oil spill event. The short-lived radioisotopes is the focus we're going to talk about for the most part today um, in controlling that timing of deposition and those rates of deposition became a critical component. Our tool, uh, we use um, short-lived radioisotopes. Part of it is because they're particle reactive. They attach to sediment particles. They're transported with, deposited, and accumulate with sediments. And we know their properties of chemistry, their half-life, how long is their timing for them to decay away, their sources, and that one of the critical components is that their change in activity is only due to decay, so their change in activity is due to time. Um, most common used are uh, lead-210, thorium-234, cesium-137, and beryllium-7, and they can all be measured simultaneously using uh, gamma spectroscopy and, uh, by gamma emissions. This is our lab. Uh, on the end is Chuck. But how many people know the other three? <laughs> is that a question for later? 
Um, so, but for this project in the deep sea environment, cesium-137 and beryllium-7 are not detectable. Um, and that's part of due to their atmospheric source. So we're going to focus on lead 210 excess and thorium-234. Uh, lead 210 is, has a 22-year half-life and can provide age control over the past 100 years. So this is very useful to look at pre-event baselines and what's the natural variability of sedimentation. The thorium-234 has a very short half-life of 24 days. Um, so you're looking at very short uh, time periods of sedimentation, uh, but also tr uh, traditionally has been used as an indication of the, uh, how much bioturbation is going on in surficial sediments. So the short sources of short-lived radioisotopes, we're not going to talk about two of the main ones here. We're going to focus on the lead-210 and the thorium-234. These are uh, daughter products of the uranium-238 decay series. And uranium is present in solution in seawater, but it also is present in continental rocks. So how we use this, this is the decay series. You have the source, uranium-238, and it goes through a sister uh, products, lead-210 and thorium-234 being the two we're primarily focusing on. And in sediment columns, we have time or depth. Um, both excess thorium-234 and excess lead-210 are comprised of two components. There's a supported component, and then there's the excess component, and together they're the total. So here we have our total lead-210 and total thorium-234. These are what we measure in the lab. So we needed to find out what our supported is to be able to calculate the excess, which is the datable portion. So the supported, thorium, or supported is a function of, so this brown circle represents a sediment particle. That particle has uranium-238 in it that is constantly decaying and creating that supported um, lead-210 or thorium-234. When you have uranium uh, outgassing as well as in seawater, when it's not supported by that particle, it's in the, represented as pink, that attaches to particles that's particle reactive, and this is the excess that is the datable portion, which is this pink part of this graph over here that decays with time to being not detectable. So when we measure, we measure the total. So it's these two components together. So we have to define the supported to be able to calculate the excess from our measured total. And this excess is what decays with time, so we need to isolate that. The way we, so for thorium-234, it's a direct daughter of uranium-238. So there's nothing we can measure before that in the analyses to define that supported thorium-234. So what we do is we'll reanalyze the same sample once all of the excess is decayed away, so we wait six months, reanalyze it, and that will be our supported. Or we can look down core to older sediments to what that supported activity is. For uh, lead 210 supported, we can actually use uh, lead 214 and bismuth 214 as proxies for that supported activity. So we can measure those uh, directly. So we measure total, supported, and then we calculate our excess for the dating purposes. So once again, we're going to use the lead 210 for the longer time scale uh, in, in baseline information and focusing it on thorium-234. Uh, we feel we can use, it's often used as by an indicator of bioturbation or mixing. Um, where you have stratigraphy, you don't have mixing, rapid sedimentation rates, and you have that fine sampling resolution, um, you may be able to use this thorium-234 excess as a dating tool or a geochronometer. So it could be very, quite good in dep in, for depositional events. So some of our preliminary short-lived radioisotope data, here we have our core photograph versus depth in centimeters. Um, this is for DSHO-8 collected in 2010. So we have our thorium-234 total, lead-210 total, our three background proxies that we use of lead-214 and bismuth-214. Uh, and what we notice is where we would expect to have indications of some sort of event that's recent in 2010, it would be near the surface. And we notice we have these increases in these radioisotopes that were relatively st stable down core in the near surface. So is this a radioisotopic signature of the Deepwater Horizon event? Well, we also notice that they happen to be when we analyze really small sample sizes associated with mm -hmm. that two millimeter sampling intervals. And we came to the conclusion that these increases here and in, in some, a lot of these radioisotopes is a function of how we were analyzing these samples and calibrating uh, to get from what we're analyzing to the actual activity. So this is not a function of the event, it's a product of the lab. So we need to solve this issue. So getting a little bit down into the rabbit hole, how do we, how do we get uh, to our radioisotope activities that we use for our dating? So what we measure are gamma emissions, and they come out as counts per minute per gram. 
we want to convert it to activity, disintegrations per minute per gram. So how many counts per minute per gram equals what activity? And the way we do this is we have known standards um, from the uh, International Atomic Energy Association. And we know the activity. We analyze the counts. So we, then we can create a relationship of how many counts equals what activity and calculate a conversion factor that we use to convert from counts from the lab to activity. Um, we started using this RGU-1 standard. It's a silica-based ore, fine-grained sediment. It's got a lot of activity. You can analyze it in an hour or two. It's quite quick. Whereas the 447, it's an organic sediment, but you have to analyze it for a day or two. So it takes more instrument time to actually do the analyses to create this conversion factor. So if you have a higher conversion factor, your measurement efficiency is lower for that radioisotope. So I'm going to walk you through how we actually do this in the lab starting with the uh, IAEA RGU-1. So we analyze samples over a range of sample masses, so we analyze a standard over a range of sample masses. We calculate that conversion factor of that known activity of the standard to what the analyzed results were for each of those analyses. And then we plot those conversion factors versus the mass analyzed. So here we have our conversion factor. This is for uh, lead-214, one of the energies. And here's our sample mass analyzed. So you can see that it doesn't stay constant with varying sample mass. But there seems to be a relationship as you change sample mass to what that conversion factor is. So we do a second order polynomial fit to that data and create a mathematical equation that describes this relationship with respect to the sample mass. So what we can do is calculate activity of our actual analyzed samples from sediment cores by using the sample mass into this equation. So if you remember, especially in the small sample masses that we analyzed, these conversion factors seemed too high. They were giving activities that were too, uh, too high or seemed unreasonable. So if we perform the same steps with the other standards, the one that's organic sediment based, the IAEA 447, it's much more similar compositionally to our actual sediment samples. And we find that the conversion factor relationship with mass is distinctly different. And in particular, at small sample masses, your conversion factors are lower, and they're going to give you lower activities. So moving forward, um, doing a calibration using material, a standard that's more similar to the material we're analyzing became very important. Um, this, this relationship uh, held true for all the primary radioisotopes we, we were looking at. So our three proxies for background lead-210, total lead-210, uh, thorium-234, as well as uh, total lead 210. So this difference, um, particularly for the background proxies in thorium 234, which will become important later, uh, was significant. But we wanted to test this on real cores. Say, is, all right, uh, the standard, the calibrations are different. Does it really translate to a difference in our sediment cores? So we used our DSH-08 from our study in the, uh, for the Deepwater Horizon, but we also had a companion project that looked at the Ixtoc-1 oil spill um, for comparison of a different region to say, you know, can these, uh, do, does this translate to a difference in our cores? So on the left, here's DSH-08 and IXW on the right. In the hot colors are calibrations using the RGU-1, the one that's overestimating activities. And on the left, in the colder colors, are using the 447. Um, and the 447 right here is the, where we change our sampling regime from 2 millimeters to 5, so that's where our analyzed sample masses change. We can see this deviation uh, holds true in actual sediment cores. And if we take that similar data and we plot it versus activity versus that sample mass um, like we did for the calibrations, we're very similar near the 15 to 20 grams, but as we get below 10 grams, the RGU-1 um, activities become too high or unreasonable. And these indicators all should be relatively constant over time. So getting back to where we were with Thorium-234, we don't directly measure the supported, so we have to use the reanalysis and down core samples of act their activity to estimate the Thorium-234 supported to be able to calculate our excess properly. So for Thorium-234, um, looking at down core, we have our profile versus depth here. Here's where we change our sample interval and go to smaller masses. So if we use this activity, it would be distinctly diff for supported uh, thorium-234. Our excess may be uh, miscalculated. When we did the reanalysis, so the orange being the RG1, the blues being the 447, we can also see that there's a huge difference in the calculated activity. 
um, of that excess would be calculated from this. The 447 is much lower. The background uh, reanalysis and the, the hash marks are all of similar activities. So this will have really big implications when we try to really use this to quantify and look at that short-term deposition from the Deepwater Horizon event. So question is why? Why is there a difference in these standards? Um, looking at two different variables that can impact in the analyses of, uh, for short-lived radioisotopes, one being self-absorption and the other being the sample height, larger mass, taller sample height. Self-absorption um, is when gamma photons, which is what we're measuring, gamma emissions, collide with particles. So if you have a silica-based sediment versus organic-based sediment, you have higher self-absorption in the RGU1. That's going to give you a lower efficiency in measurement and have those higher CF values. In the 447, you have lower self-absorption and you get higher efficiency of the measurement. And this is more similar to the sediment samples we actually analyze from our cores. So the sample height is very similar. So just to orient you on this plot, so we have our detector. It's a planar detector, so gamma emissions are only detected if they interact with that plane, but they can come off in all 360 degrees, all directions. So you have a gamma emission in the red dot, and if it interacts with the detector, um, it's going to travel, depending on if it's at the top of the sample or not, it's traveling through the material and having self-absorption occur before it gets detected. So the sample height is very similar, so self-absorption in small masses is more, more important. When you make a taller sample, the RG1 is more expanded, the silica-based standard is more compacted, so you get this difference in sample height uh, where you have a longer distance to travel for gamma emissions to actually get to the detector and be counted, as well as your angle that emissions can come off um, is more reduced, so you have less instance of counting. Um, so you actually end up with lower efficiency of measurement for the 447 and higher CF values um, at the higher masses. So we see that is what we're seeing here, the orange line being the RGU1 and the 447. So you get sample height, longer distance, creating higher CF values in the 447 relative to the RGU1, and self-absorption dominating the influence in the small masses where, we, where this all matters. So after all that, now we feel strongly that our short-lived radioisotope isotope activities and data are, uh, are correct, and we have confidence in the information we're getting from them. So we're getting back to our study on the deep water horizon in our sediment cores. Um, just to reorient you, we're going to talk about the four time series sites and how we use those short-lived radioisotopes in the rapid response and time series collections. So here's a core log um, for just as an example of the type of information that we get. We have our core photograph versus uh, depth in centimeters. Here we have our sediment texture. It's pretty constant over the last hundred years. Um, there's a slight deviation here at the surface. We'll talk about it a little later. In composition, uh, carbonate, organic, and other, other being dominantly terrigenous. Relatively constant over the last 100 years, slight deviations maybe at the surface. Um, this is our ex uh, excess lead 210 profile that we use to create our age model dating to assess these things over the last 100 years to try and look at the baseline uh, sedimentology and how it may have varied uh, prior to the event. So looking at how do we look at the sedimentation, and we're going to look at sedimentation versus accumulation. So sedimentation being settling of particles to the seafloor, but they may be remobilized, resuspended, and transported elsewhere. So they don't always translate to accumulation. Um, so they're not always represented in the sediment record, and they're often on short time scales such as the deep water horizon event. So accumulation, once again, settling of particles to the seafloor, but they, they stay at the primary area of deposition. They don't get remobilized and they're subsequently buried, and these are what compose dominantly of the sedimentary record and look at generally longer time scales. So the Thorium-234 is going to be looking at short-term sedimentation, not necessarily always accumulation. Uh, it's an indicator of approximately four months of time of sedimentation. Um, since it's such a short, short time frame and short half-life, we have to analyze these really quickly to capture this data um, and do some decay corrections uh, for, the, for the activities. Um, here on the right are the four depth profiles of thorium-234 excess activities from DSH-08, D10 on the Celeste Classic side, and MO4 and PCB-06 on the carbonate side. Um, depth here is in millimeters, so we're looking at the top two centimeters. Um, this is the activity profiles versus depth, and we'll come back to these types of profiles later as we go through our time series. But we're going to take these profiles and we're going to interpret them in two ways. Uh, we're going to take a look at mass accumulation rates 
and the inventory. And so this mass accumulation rates, um, MARs, are a function of the linear accumulation rates based upon the age dating and the bulk density, so you get a total mass. They correct for differential compaction and course, since we're looking at the very surface, can be fluidized so that can compact with time. They can be an indicator of sedimentation on that four month time window, but they can also be influenced by mixing and bioturbation. The inventories are some of the activity in that profile, so this is also where those calibrations really mattered because this activity would have been distinctly different if we hadn't noticed that we were having an issue with uh, our process. They're an indicator of flux to the seafloor associated with sedimentation, but these are independent of bioturbation and mixing. So using these two in tandem, we can get some insight into what is actually sedimentation versus what might be influenced by bioturbation in our sediment records. So we have no pre-event data that's similar, so we don't have a baseline prior. So the depositional pulse, um, we have sediment up here is the mass accumulation rates on the top. We have high mass accumulation rates at all the time series sites at about a 0.4 to one centimeter thick layer, both sides of the, uh, both sedimentary regimes. Inventory is gonna be in the bottom panel here. Um, these are also high, or so we thought. We didn't know until we kept uh, doing the time series. Um, and this is indicating increased flux to the seafloor associated with sediments. So by doing the time series, we're able to go out and kind of retroactively create baselines using uh, this direct indicator. So in 2011, 2012, the mass accumulation rates decreased, and so did the inventories, which gave us a strong indication that this deposition pulse was higher um, during this event of the deep water horizon. Some other indicators of this depositional pulse that were uh, from some of those other eight cores collected in colleagues. So we have our higher sedimentation rates, uh, there was a decrease in absence of bethnic forams. There were shifts in the redox boundary that were also indicative of a change in sediment flux or sedimentation, and also found higher concentrations of hydrocarbons in that surficial layer of that sedimentation pulse. And this was attributed to that MOSFA event, that marine oiled snow sedimentation and flocculent accumulation. And a lot of the indicators for that were because there were indicators of surface origin from that interaction of oil with surface phytoplankton. Uh, is indicated by increased planktic foraminifera, uh, pyrogenic hydrocarbons burned from the surface during some of the response efforts, as well as um, surficial phytoplankton indicators. So getting back to this figure, so we have a rapid collection of cores which allowed us to capture the event, and we continued this time series to see how this evolved and create kind of retroactive baselines for thorium-234 excess. So as we go through to 2016, uh, we have this stabilization of sedimentation patterns. Um, the inventories still remain relatively low, indicating that sedimentation, the sediment pulse was anomalously high using this indicator. Um, and this might be an indicator of nice baseline variability in sedimentation at these sites. But we started to see the mass accumulation rates increase at site-specific regions. Um, this is an apparent mass accumulation rate. We now have the influence of bioturbation on this indicator, and which is shown as higher uh, apparent mass accumulation rates without a supporting higher inventory of sediment flux. We can look at this in a little bit of a different way. If we come back to the thorium-234 excess profiles versus depth, using two examples, one from the carbonate side and the other one from the silice clastic side. So here we have our profiles of activity versus depth uh, from the 2010. This is the depositional pulse. And as we go into 2011 to 2012, that decrease, but lack of bioturbation that was going on, we have a decrease in the profile depth, as well as a decrease in the relative activity as indicated by the MARs and the inventories. But as we go through time, at the M04 site in the blues for the 2013-14 year, we still have shallow profile depths and low activities, but at site DSH08, we see this deepening of the profile. And this is the effect of bioturbation to deepen this profile and mix the thorium-234 excess down core, which is reflected in that higher apparent mass accumulation rates. And then we go to our last step and we have that deepening of this profile at both sites continued. So this is a potential indication of bioturbation starting to have an influence in the upper centimeter, but also might be an indication of recovery of the benthic system and the biology there. So that looks at the sediment pulse. So we have sedimentation rates that are higher and the timing of it and its evolution over the subsequent years. But in the sedimentology and the sediment texture and composition, 
what may maybe do um, do we have any indicators or signatures of the Deepwater Horizon event preserved or expressed in that parameter? So looking at our four time series sites, and we're going to zoom in on the red box in a moment, the down core, so this is looking at five years accumulated of this type of data down core versus age based upon lead 210 models. So we have the gray shading and the, the black line are the average of those uh, five cores over the past to try and create what's the natural variability and how variable is it and then each year is expressed in the surface as its own plot. Um, as before the hot colors are associated with the uh, Deepwater Horizon event that time frame and collections in 2010 and 11 and we see these deviations in uh, percent silt. Uh, we didn't see much change in the composition and so that primarily this was the strongest indicator we saw even though it was relatively subtle. Um, so we see this deviation at almost all sites, but as we go through time into the blue colors, that deviation is no longer present or it's no longer detectable. Um, so the sediment texture may not be a good long-term signature to use in sediment records for looking at the deep water horizon event in the sedimentary record. So getting into the detection in the sedimentary record, uh, the preservation potential of this event there are the parameters we talked about that could influence this, remobilization and resuspension, transporting deposited sediments that were sedimented based upon the Thorium-234, but not maybe potentially not accumulating over time. If you do get burial and sedimentation, we have to look for that bioturbation, which is going to mix sediments uh, and may mix that event layer with non-event sediments and dilute the signature, make it harder to detect or undetectable in the sedimentary record. Um, you can also then eventually dewater and compact that layer. It'll only get thinner over time and therefore become uh, more challenging to detect and require higher resolution sampling. And then you may have alteration or degradation of some of the indicators that may have been key during right after the event but may change over time as it gets buried. So looking at preservation potential, we have our sediment pulse layer uh, represented here as a red bar. We have our, our thorium-234 is orange dot, so we have high sedimentation as indicated by all, uh, higher activities of thorium-234 excess. If you get resuspension, you're going to have no preservation at these sites of initial deposition um, as it has been picked up, transported, and moved elsewhere most likely. If you have burial and compaction, you have new material uh, being deposited on top, but the layer is intact. This might be what's going on at D10. Um, we never saw strong indications of uh, bioturbation returning at that site. It might be an indication that it hasn't recovered or potentially bioturbation isn't a strong influence in that region. If you get bioturbation returning, the question becomes, is it interacting with that event layer or is that layer staying below that bioturbation depth where you may have actual preservation of it? If, if it is interacting with that layer, the uh, poten preservation potential uh, decreases. So putting this in the context of our thorium 34 so we have our depositional pulse and our pulse layer. Um, resuspension could be going on at any of these time frames. Um, it can come years after the fact. Um, burial and compaction going on with low bioturbation during this uh, following two years. And then as we get into the stabilization, a site-specific return of bioturbation to the system. We also see this potentially with the sedimentology, where we see the signature in the early years, 2010 to 2011, but the sedimentary signature of the Deepwater Horizon becomes undetectable or not preserved over the longer period of time, um, it potentially uh, indicating re remobilization and or uh, the influence of bioturbation. So some of the implications of the remobilization of MOSFOR or DWH uh, sediments is renewed exposure for biological impacts. Um, Polster found that there's increased pHs that was associated with resuspension events in the northern Gulf of Mexico from tropical cyclones. So these are some of the things that may be looking at. It also poses the question of where does MOSFOR truly accumulate in the longer term time scale? Um, we've identified where it went in the short term, but with potential remobilization, what is the ultimate fate and where do you actually sequester these uh, sediments uh, into the deep Gulf of Mexico? And the way that we can look at that and are beginning to look at that is using the lead 210 chronology to look at longer time scales as we get further away from the event. We're now nine, 10 years out. And so these are the uh, lead 210 excess profiles versus its age for four of the years, 2010, 12, 14, and 16. Um, one thing is that we do have nice reproducibility in the sedimentary record, but 
when we focus in on the very surface, we can try and look at if we're seeing indications of sediment pulses as expressed in the Latitude 10, which would be in these areas of red shading that um, have activities that are of similar, or have plateaus of similar activity, indicating that those sediments are of the same age and they might be from a pulse of sediment accumulating. These are also at two millimeter resolution, so this is where also uh, high resolution sampling is important because if we averaged half a centimeter or one centimeter, these plateaus would become um, undiscernible in the sedimentary record. So taking these age controls to identify where the 2010 time frame may be, then we can work with our collaborators to look for what preserved signatures there may be in the sedimentary record to corroborate se by sedimentology, biology, or chemically, um, it, are there DWH sediments associated with where we think there may be sedimentation pulses based on the chronologies. So getting back to our objectives, um, here we have our first one. So we um, had high temporal resolution, so we got high sampling resolution, which led to small sample masses. So we had to reevaluate some of our methodology in particular for the short-lived radioisotopes. We only recognized that we needed to do this by applying it to an actual study in real cores and the deep water horizon event. Um, number two, investigating the sedimentological impact of the Deepwater Horizon. We, we found subtle signatures of the event, um, but primarily was an increase in the rate of Thorm-234 and increase in sedimentation. We could only detect this using high-resolution sampling, two millimeters, as well as using the time-sensitive geochronometers of Thorm-234 excess, which was only possible due to the rapid collection of cores, but also being able to define those baselines using the time series collection over the subsequent six to seven years. Some of the challenges um, we had, so the rapid, be able to do these things and get that rapid response, you have to collect your cores rapidly, but you also have to analyze them rapidly. Um, that high resolution sampling leads to small sample sizes, which also sometimes limits your analytical capabilities. And then you also need to reevaluate how you're interpreting your data because you're looking at a different time scale. There's short duration processes that may be more stronger influence than if you're averaging longer time scales. You also need to have comparisons at that time scale to really define that deviation in the sedimentary record. Um, so having baselines of comparable time scales could be very critical. And you need to constantly evaluate the influences of post-deposition, such as bioturbation, compaction, and remobilization. The advantages, we were able to detect the unaltered sedimentary response of the event and detect that depositional pulse. Um, and constrain that event on the similar time scales of the event itself. We also identified sedimentation, and other colleagues have as well, that they may not be preserved in the sedimentary record or detectable as time goes by and things become buried or mixed. And uh, this provides insight for the full magnitude of the event in the sedimentary system to apply for implications to biological impacts, whether they be short-term or long-term. So the deep water horizon, um, we had the depositional pulse in 2010, is defined by high sedimentation and shutdown of the bioturbation that... Uh, associated with that observed MOSFA event um, and a slight deviation in texture. The subsequent two years had still continued low sedimentation rates and a continued lack of bioturbation in the system. And then it took about three years for stabilization and potentially site-specific return to bioturbation as indicated by the apparent mass accumulation rates. The exception being DSHO10, which we don't have pre-event data to be able to determine whether bioturbation just is never present at this area or if it just has not recovered. Um, also, our sedimentological signature and silt uh, decrease was undetectable or not preserved um, with time. And uh, long-term preservation and ultimate fate uh, using the age control with using LED 210 to continue to track this and look at uh, spatial extent and uh, identify what signatures may be preserved in the sedimentary record. So the critical approaches, um, prompt core collection to use those time-sensitive indicators in Thorium 234 the high sampling resolution to resolve that in sedimentary record, not over average uh, the time intervals. The time series was critical to create baselines after the event on the similar time scale to be able to really define what that deviation was and the strength of that deviation, as well as what, how did that uh, layer and event in those uh, evolved over time and what's its potential preservation in the sedimentary record. This can be applied to different oceanographic and geologic settings. Um, you know, with the idea that you need to, as always, collect cores with good stratigraphic integrity that may contain the event, and, and determining for that setting the right tools to identify the signature and your geochronological tools appropriate for your setting, um, including that 
Thorm 234XS was really good in the deep sea, but doesn't work in coastal environments where beryllium-7 might become a better tool for that time scale. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, funding agencies through the Gol uh, Gomer, uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. It's part of Sea Image 1, Deep Sea, Sea Image 2, Sea Image 3, and in part by a college NSSRP. Uh, family, friends, a slew of, of individuals, including uh, many generations of undergraduate students. And uh, data is available with a whole bunch of numbers at the bottom. <laughs> and with that, here's for the fisheries people, here's a fish picture. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Becca. Excellent. Very clear.